Well, good morning, Desert Chapel. We've got a lot of announcements this morning, so bear with me. Uh, first of all, it will get cooler. We're not sure. Well, I didn't say when. What was it 106 today or 108 or whatever? Apache Junction's cooler than what? It's better than it was in August. It's better than it was in August for those of you that were worried. So um, the uh, northern part of the state's officially closed. Mike and Marianne are back. I think they are. <laughs> um, announcements. Shoe boxes. Um, after service today, they're gonna, there's going to be cake and coffee in the back. So if you want to join us and uh, uh, pick up your shoe box to start filling it up, uh, we're kicking, up, kicking that off today. And then when is the, when's the deadline, Nancy? 15th of November? Okay, so don't wait till the last minute because the 15th of November is also the rummage sale. And we need volunteer. We've got a lot of stuff. I was in the room yesterday, I think it was, or Friday, and it's we got a lot of stuff. We're going to open another room. We can okay. So we any any rummage that you have, and then we're looking into doing a, um, a kind of a mass mailing to try to get the word out because we really want to drive people here to see us. You know, we we don't have the sign up there anymore, so we're going to try to figure out ways to get people to to come here. Um, if not for the rummage sale, um, other things that we have going on, community feast and so forth. Turkey boxes. Um, we're shooting, last year we had 55. We're shooting for at least 50 this year and hope we'll have more. And so again, that's mid-November that we need to get all that together. If you have, if you find a deal on turkeys, frozen turkeys, we can start accepting them because we have place in Wooler Hall to do that. Uh, it takes keys to get in, so if you come during the week, about the only time that you could drop them off during the week would be Monday through Friday when Iris is in the office, right? Monday and Friday, not through Friday, Monday and or Friday. Um, from 8 until what? About 3. So if you Start doing that. If you find a deal on turkeys, uh, get us in because we could. If we if we get more than fifty, it's not a problem, right? Okay, good. Um, we need volunteers for the uh, uh, for cleaning and pricing of all the stuff for the uh, for the rummage sale. The Chargers breakfast starts November sixteenth. Is that right, Jim? Sixteenth, third Saturday in. Third Saturday. Um, and speaking of Jim, we, we need some ushers. We need more ushers. So uh, eventually we're going to need a head usher, but for now we're just looking for people to volunteer to be ushers. So you, again, you can uh, let the office know at Iris. You can, if you grab Ron Long, he can, he can at least take your name down. Um, char Church Charge Conference, November 26th at 5 p.m. Um, Another thing, Nancy's organ, Nancy January is organizing a trip to the Organ Stop Pizza. If you haven't been there, it's pretty, it's a, it, well, I haven't been there, but we're going to plan on going. That's on Friday, when is that, Friday? October 25th on Friday. So if you want to go to the Organ Stop P Pizza place as a group, see Nancy January. You could also sign up in the office with Iris on Monday or Friday. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. There's a sign-up sheet. There are several sign-up sign up sheets, one for the, the uh, turkey boxes, one for the uh, um, shoe boxes. <laughs> I didn't write all this stuff down. There's a lot going on. Um, anything else? Pastor, do you have anything else? Yes. Oh yeah, we'll we'll if if you need a ride and still want to go to Oregon Stop, just sign up, leave your, leave your phone number, and we'll figure out a way to uh, either meet here, come and get you, or whatever to get down there and do that. It'll be a fun time. I can't think of anything else. So, Michael, are you ready to birthdays, oh. birthdays and anniversaries? 
All right. Birthdays. We've got a number of them up on the, we had them up on the screen. Uh, who's got a birthday in, what month is this? Oct- October. I can't tell because it's 106. All right, we have one over here. Anybody else with birthdays? Okay, good. All right, let's do that. Happy birthday to you. Anniversaries, way in the back. At least one here. I'm sure there might be some more out there in our uh, on our listeners and watchers. And, pardon? Pastor's wife is hands up, but pastor's hands not up. Oh, no. huh? I don't want to start anything here. All right, anniversary song. Birthdays and anniversaries. Congratulations to all of you. All right, now, Michael, lead us into worship, please. are we with this gentleman. If you can comfortably do so, please stand during the responsive call to worship. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a land of suffering? We shall sing of courage and the strength of the Lord. How shall we sing the Lord's song when we feel so lonely? We shall sing of unity and faithfulness of reconciliation and hope. Come, let us sing the Lord's song today. Let us praise God in all our ways forever. 
Amen. Our opening hymn is number 630, Become to Us the Living Bread. And it may not be familiar to everyone, so Michael's going to play it through one time. together in the unite uh, yeah the opening prayer <laughs> on this world communion Sunday we thank you O oh God for the reminder that we are not alone in every age people have known joy and struggle so it is at this moment grant us wisdom courage and discipline that we might see and testify to this truth May we weep with those who weep, even as we ourselves have been comforted. We pray in the spirit of grace, mercy, and peace. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church family. My name is Philip Tesarek. I am the pastor here at Desert Chapel, and we are blessed that you are here worshiping with us here in this beautiful sanctuary or online, this is an important time. This is a time when we come together as a congregation, as a community of Christ to pray for those, our friends and our family, our loved ones, our neighbors, and those people around the world or our community that we may never meet. This is a praying church, and I encourage you to share your prayer requests, your concerns, and your joys with the congregation. You can do that if you're here in the sanctuary by dropping a note before service under prayer bearer, by filling out a prayer request card that are located in the back of the pews. You can drop that in the offering plate later in service, or you can email the church office at info at desertchapelumc.org. Now, today we have a wonderful praise to lift. Marilyn Schultz is not only back home, but she is with us today and doing better. We are so happy to see her recovering. We continue to lift up prayers for those who have been devastated by Hurricane Helene in the eastern part of the United States up to the Appalachians, to the Carolinas. Uh, the devastation there is hard to understand how large it is. Uh, for someone even who grew, like me who grew up in the Hurricane Alley, uh, the signs, uh, the, the pictures are just horrifying. And we continue to lift up prayers for Rick and Greta's son and grandson, who both lost their homes during this hurricane. Uh, let us continue to lift up all of those people uh, in the eastern United States. The United Methodist uh, Commission on Relief, UMCOR is the acronym, has already started some work to put together uh, how we can donate 
to help the, the, the they're going to send out teams of supplies and volunteers out there. We'll be sharing that with you via email as soon as we have it. It's just starting to come together uh, if you wish to donate to those relief efforts. We continue to lift up Jerry Dumholtz, who is continuing to recover our liturgist uh, after she got in a fight with a large bear and uh, <laughs> broke several fingers and lost. But she's here with us, but let's continue to lift her up for healing. Uh, continued prayers for the uh, friends and family of Kathy Highland's friend Arlene, who, who was uh, suffering from cancer. She passed away peacefully two weeks ago, uh, but her family and friends are missing her. We continue to lift up Bill Garriott's daughter's mother-in-law, who's been diagnosed with terminal cancer and has now been moved to hospice. We continue to pray for Jim Edwards, who is continuing his recovery from COVID-19. We continue to pay, pray for Bill Gowans, who is waiting for that critical hernia, hernia surgery. We pray for Sally Steiner's daughter-in-law, who had been hospitalized. We pray for Marilyn Schultz's friend, Gay, who has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. We continue to pray for Peggy Cabrina's son, Greg, who is continuing to suffer from multiple medical issues. And we continue to pray for Lori Wilburn, Jim Edwards' daughter, as she continues her battle with stage four non-smoker lung cancer. Let us bow our heads. Loving God, we come to you together blessed to be here, blessed to have a day of life in front of us on this beautiful day, World Communion Sunday. We thank you for our church and our families and our friends. And we also miss those who are not with us today. We pray for healing for those who are sick, ill, who are recovering from illness, who are in hospitals, care homes, or hospice. Lord, we read the news, we look at the pictures, and we see devastation, suffering, and death. We are overwhelmed. We do not understand. We pray for a moment of peace and healing for each and every person who has lost their homes, their livelihood, or who are family members of those who have lost their lives in the flooding and devastation. Lord, we pray for, for unity as Christians. We pray that in that word, meaning that we realize our commonalities together. We realize what brings us together rather than tears us apart, even though we are diverse people. And we celebrate that diversity. Help us to see the common core that brings us together. Lord, we walked into here today with concerns and joys and fears buried deep in our hearts. Now let us lift those silently in prayer to you. Almighty God, Mother of mercy, Father of grace, you have called us to one table, but we have pursued our own course. You have promised us the abundance of all creation, but in our greed and in our envy, the world goes without. You have promised us the bread of life itself, but in our pride and in our arrogance, the world goes hungry. You have promised us the waters of peace and justice, but in our violence and in our discord, the world goes thirsty. And now we are famished too, Lord. Have mercy on us. Forgive us again. Transform us at this table and for this table and send us from this table as servants of your righteousness by the power of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Luke 22, verses 14 through 20. 
When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Our second scripture reading is from Galatians 3, verses 23 through 29. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs to, according to the promise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand if you are able. Hymn number 620, One Bread, One Body.
Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, welcome to World Communion Sunday. The first Sunday in October is designated as World Communion Sunday, which celebrates our oneness in Christ with all of our brothers and sisters around the world. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are to discern the body when we partake of Holy Communion, mindful that we note our relationship with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ in the celebration. World Communion Sunday is a celebration observed by many Christian denominations taking place on the first Sunday of every October. One of the goals is to promote Christian unity and ecumenical cooperation. The tradition was begun in 1933 by Hugh Kerr, who was administered in Shadyside Presbyterian Church. It was then adopted throughout the Presbyterian Church in 1936 and subsequently by the National Council of Churches in 1940. The National Council of Churches is the largest ecumenical body in the United States. Its member communions include mainline Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, African American, Evangelical, and Historic Peace Churches. Together, it encompasses more than 100,000 local congregations and 40 million church members. Imagine that, all 40 million of us taking communion together today. That's a big church family. In the United Methodist Church, we serve grape juice instead of wine so that all may partake in this celebration. Other faith celebrations do use wine, but both are fruit of the vine as defined in the Old and the New Testament. Years ago, when I was first a liturgist and helping with communion, I spilled some or maybe a whole lot of grape juice on a lady's beautiful white blouse. I almost left the church and never came back. <laughs> Even in the United Methodist churches, I have experienced a wide variety of bread served as I visited other churches and served under different pastors. In Western Christianity, unleavened breads are often used in Holy Communion because it is believed that Jesus used unleavened bread at the Last Supper. However, in Eastern Rite Catholicism, leavened breads are used for Holy Communion because in the Eastern tradition, they view yeast in the bread as similar to soul in the body. All different, all the same. On World Communion Sunday, we should talk about the texts that bring us the Sacrament of Communion. This event was, has been generally called the Last Supper, and we talk about it at least once a year on Maundy Thursday. Maundy Thursday is the Thursday before Easter on which Jesus and the disciples came together in the upper room for what the disciples thought was going to be a Passover Seder meal. In the Gospel of John, this is also where Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. But Jesus turned the tables on the disciples, and the Last Supper was so much more than a Seder meal. Now, we could spend a month-long sermon series just talking about Holy Communion and how critical that is to our spiritual lives. Communion, along with baptism, those are our two sacraments that we have in the United Methodist Church. Now, there is no World Baptism Sunday, but we will talk about that on Baptism of the Lord Sunday, which is coming in January. The Last Supper is described in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, and the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. But today's text, we are using the Gospel of Luke. I do encourage you to read all three versions. Now, Luke and Acts were really written as one book originally. Luke was a well-educated physician. He was a companion to Paul. He was a historian. People aren't sure if he was a Gentile or a Jew, but they believe he came from what's now Syria. He didn't come from Jerusalem. And when you read Luke, look for Pauline theology in it. In chapter 22, we are really near the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Walking into the upper room that evening, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen next and who would betray him. 
disciples. At this point, they still weren't getting it. They still didn't truly understand who Jesus was and what he had come to do. They didn't really have that epiphany until Jesus' ascension in chapter 24. And we know from Palm Sunday that the Jewish people still thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah that they wanted. A priest, warrior, king that was going to lead them to defeat the occupying Romans. Up until this point, Jesus had been teaching and preaching throughout Galilee. He'd gone up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He'd come down into Jerusalem. He'd, gone, he'd been teaching in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers. And he continued to make enemies of the religious and political leaders in Jerusalem. It would be hard to imagine that the mood going into this Seder dinner was anything but tense and anxious. I'm guessing the disciples were afraid, nervous, and scared. By this point, Judas had already betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And he was with Jesus in the room that night. Now, despite the famous depiction of the Last Supper by the artist Leonardo da Vinci, the event did not occur in a spacious room with chairs and tables. After all, this was the ancient Near East. People didn't have the same furniture that we know in the same way we think about it. They wore sandals throughout the day, and they took them off before they went into a room because the floors are where people ate and slept on. They ate at low tables while reclining on cushions on the floor, and they slept on mats on the floor also. So taking off one's shoes at the door reflected cleanliness and good manners and it avoiding carrying dirt into the living areas. That's the problem with amazing and talented art. It tends to sear images into our minds and make us ignore the facts and the history. The upper room was probably a small room with poor ventilation and dimly lit by candles and oil lamps. The true sight of the upper room is still debating. In that room was Jesus and 12 very different people. Now one had already betrayed him, and another, Simon Peter, would go on to deny him three times very soon. I'm sure they were paying attention to Jesus, their teacher. They probably weren't smiling. We already knew that the disciples were a pretty diverse, different bunch of folks. Four of them were fishermen who probably owned their own businesses. Three more may have been fishermen, probably workers, not owners. One was a tax collector, which was a really hated profession. One was a thief. One was a zealot who believed in anarchy and the violent overthrow of the government. And the rest, we have no idea what they did as professions or backgrounds. One of them may have been a carpenter. Two of the fishermen, James and John, were called sons of thunder by Jesus himself because they had such short tempers. A thief, an anarchist, a carpenter, some business owners, some workers, and several people with anger management issues. Imagine that for your Thanksgiving family dinner. And these, minus Judas, will soon have the epiphany that Jesus is Christ, that Jesus has been sent from God not to overthrow the Romans, but save us, all of us from our sins. They will soon understand that Christ has been sent to offer all of us grace and forgiveness. This motley crew of people would, who probably argued loudly about a great many things will be unified to spread out across the known world to spread the gospel and give their lives for it. The upper room that night was not an echo chamber of 12 men who thought and acted alike. And yet Jesus was demonstrating to them, and yes, telling them that they were called to sit down and break bread with all types of people. From the Gospel of Luke, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after, he took, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. From the Gospel of Matthew, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, in the Holy Land times, you didn't casually eat 
and drink with just anyone. Breaking bread was an intimate, familial act. And Jesus was doing this with a man who'd already mortally betrayed him, and another who would deny him publicly three times. And yet Jesus actively wanted to bring them together for this meal, to establish this sacrament, and to teach this important lesson. And I drive down the road today, and you see all types of churches in different denominations. We here are close to uh, Lutherans, Catholics, Baptists, Pentecostals, Seventh-day Adventists, just to name a few, as well as a growing number of non-denominational Christian churches. Social scientists tell us that fewer people are affiliating with denominational churches and that fewer people are even identifying as Christian. So what is this Christian unity thing that we were talking about earlier? That doesn't make interesting news. No, it's Christian disunity that makes juicy gossip and brings clicks on the social media platforms. It's easy to forget that for over 1,000 years, there was only one Christian church. In 1054 AD, the Christian church divided into two halves, the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. And the next major split wouldn't happen until Martin Luther penned his 95 theses to the door of the church in 1517. That's almost 500 years after that. And that started the Protestant Reformation. There are, more, there are now more than 45,000 Christian denominations worldwide. In the United States, there are more than 200 Christian denominations. Now, I'm proud to be a Methodist. And I certainly don't want any of you leaving this church, running down the street to join a different church. What we have here is a loving and prayerful Christian community. I believe deeply in the tenets of the United Methodist Church. And yet it is so easy to get caught up in factionalism and divisionalism. World Communion Sunday helps us all to take a deep breath as Christians and remember what brings us together. What is our common core, our center of Christianity? It's not the color of the decorations or what robes the pastor wears or what the symbol is on top of the altar or whether we even use juice or wine or what kind of bread we use. The word unity has been co-opted. It's been abused. It's been misused by people today. People with political or social agendas use that word when what they really mean is you must think and act alike. From the days of the first Christian church, the very early days of Paul, starting churches across the Mediterranean, we Christians have never looked and acted and thought alike. And Jesus never said, nor did Paul, that we should. From Paul's letter to the Galatians in the message modern translation, Paul said, by now you have arrived at your destination. By faith in Christ, you are in direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It also involved dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe, Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. In Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendant, heirs according to the covenant promises. A common relationship with Jesus Christ, that's where the unity is amongst us. That is where we should find our common ground, even with different churches of the United Methodist Church. We can celebrate Request, appreciate the uniqueness that each denomination prays, how they pray, they confess, how they commune, and how they decorate while remembering our common heritage. Last week, uh, Chris Christopherson died. He was 88 years old. He was a singer, songwriter, musician, and he was an actor. He was born in Texas. And he went on to be perhaps the only country music star that was also a Rhodes Scholar. When I was little, my mother listened to the big names in country music, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, and John Denver. When I was halfway through high school in 1985, Johnny Cash, 
Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, and Chris Christopherson, they came together to form the Highwaymen, and they released a song by the same name. It was written by a songwriter by the name of James Webb. I think I still have that on a 45 RPM single somewhere. But there's just something haunting about that song, and it's been playing over and over again in my mind since the word of Chris Christopherson's death. That song, The Highwayman, it talks about a restless, adventurous soul that never goes away. It just keeps coming back in newer forms. And no, this is not a hymn, and it's certainly not a church-approved song. At the end of the song, it, I think it's that last stanza that really gets to me. It, the song ends with, And when I reach the other side, I'll find a place to rest my spirit if I can. Perhaps I may become a highwayman again, or I may simply be a single drop of rain. But I will remain, I'll be back again and again and again and again. But that restless spirit, that's something that comes from our forefathers to us, and we pass it on to our children. But that spirit shall remain. It is the restlessness that causes us to leave home after we grow up, wondering only to find us, our spouse and our profession. Many of us have wandered away from the Lord's table, many for years, only to find ourselves called back to the table, called back to relationship with Christ and a yearning to understand. To me, that's one of the celebrations of World Communion Sunday, is not only the fact that the table is here for us and we are always invited to come to it, but regardless of how restless our spirit is or how long we've been away from the table, that the table is waiting for us, all of us. Our grandparents and our great-grandparents and those before them, they came to this same table to receive Holy Communion, to receive the Eucharist, to eat at the Lord's table, whichever term you prefer to use. It's the same table the disciples came to 2,000 years ago in that cramped, dimly lit room. We are called to pray, to eat, and to celebrate our life in Christ. That is true unity. A unity in belief that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. A firm knowledge that we are blessed, that we are chosen, and that we are loved. Disagreement's okay. Different opinions are okay. Different philosophies, different understandings of social justice and politics are okay. Because it's not about the color of the linens or the symbols on the doorway. Let us rejoice both in our differences and our shared foundation of faith. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I now invite our ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings.
God of grace and mercy, as we bring our gifts before you today, we remember your infinite love that welcomes everyone, especially the vulnerable and the overlooked. Just as Jesus embraced the little children, we bring our offerings, hoping to reflect our dedication of living out your kingdom's values. Help us to see and meet the needs around us with open hearts and willing hands, extending your grace and compassion to all. Bless these gifts and use them to further your work in our community and beyond, so everyone may know and feel your love. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare to uh, start our communion liturgy, I invite you all to open your United Methodist hymnals to page 15 and follow along for the congregational responses. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth, in all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations, and today his family in all the world is joining at his holy table. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us to be the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with your church throughout the world and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Let us come together now and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I now invite the musicians and those assisting with communion to come forward. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is a glorious day. Not only is it our opportunity, our invitation to come and eat at the Lord's table, but we are celebrating it with 40 million people across the world. In the United Methodist tradition, we use grape juice instead of wine so that all may partake at the Lord's table. We do have two lines. We have one bread, but two lines. So if you're on the right side, please follow along and go to your right. There's a basket to deposit your your empty cups on each side. If you're on the left, please go to the left. In the center, we do have free and self-contained options. If you need that, please don't hesitate. And if you need to be served at your seat, we have Denise and Nancy who are available to bring communion to you. In the United Methodist tradition, all, and I mean all, are invited to the table, no matter who you are, where you're from, or what you've done or haven't done. So let us celebrate. The table is set. Come eat.
blessing for the beautiful music. Thank you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us come together now and say the prayer after communion. We will say it in unison. It should be in your bulletins and on the screen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 2226, Bind Us Together. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together. Together, Lord, bind us together. 
Our lay leader, Dave, made a prophetic statement earlier in service. He said it will get cooler eventually. How's that for a weather forecast, right? I know. I, I notice no one's giving us a weather forecast for this week, so uh, let us continue to stay hydrated and safe until we get out of the three-digit numbers. I was pondering that 40 million people is a pretty large family gathering, right? Usually you get more than five and someone gets in an argument, so 40 million engender a few of those. But let us continue to remember there is more that brings us together. There is more that is our commonality that makes us different. And as you go out into that beautiful, still very hot, still very hot, Arizona Sunday, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his countenance to turn toward you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and bring you peace. Go forth. Amen. Amen. Please join us for cake and coffee in the back for our fellowship around the shoebox. Amen.